the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can the whole state of things, a pure violence without object and This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is the murder of the wheel, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's discussion and our guest, we just want to mention we've got a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider leaving us a dollar a month there. But if not, you know, obviously the uh, world economy is in peril. So maybe leave us a nice review on iTunes and we'd appreciate that just as well. But today, Taylor and I are very proud to bring you this week's guest, Stephen Holgate. Stephen is a professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick and president of the Hegel Society of Great Britain. His books include Hegel, Nietzsche, and the Criticism of Metaphysics, An Introduction to Hegel, Freedom, Truth, and History, The Opening of Hegel's Logic, From Being to Infinity, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, A Reader's Guide, and most recently, Hegel on Being, which is split into two volumes. But Stephen, welcome to the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour. We're very pleased to have you and very excited to uh, show our audience that we're not afraid to step into the dojo with Hegel. So. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to uh, to be here and to uh, to join you. And I hope that what we discuss over the next hour or so will be of interest to all your listeners. <laughs> I um, believe so. And shout out to Hegel this week, right? Right. right. Yeah, Good. there we go. GWF. Yeah. Uh. Stephen, we'd like to open up each episode, at least with like uh, with someone we've not spoken to before. And it's kind of a question where we want to sort of get your philosophical origin story, let's say. And that could be maybe an anecdote, a thinker, an experience, you know, some kind of moment that kind of crystallized your interest in philosophy. And you can even extend that out if you want. If you want to go into how you sort of fell into, into Hegel's work, that would be great as well. But kind of whatever you feel, something singular that you could point to, perhaps, we'd love to hear that. Yes. Well, actually, I don't have a philosophy degree of any kind. And and. Colleagues in the past have said, yes, we notice. I did modern languages as okay. a student mm -hmm. in Cambridge. And so a lot of what I was studying was German drama and Kafka mm -hmm. and Thomas Mann and so on. But there was one course that I took on German philosophy. And not only was it very interesting, but it was run in a slightly different way from all the other courses. It was run as a seminar format. And most importantly, there was a break in the middle for tea and biscuits. And that was a great <laughs> draw, I have to say. Anyway, so I began with Leibniz, Kant, Fichte, Hegel, a bit of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. And by the time I got to my PhD, what particularly struck me, although it hadn't obviously struck a lot of people before then, was the fact that Hegel and Nietzsche had a common target of criticism, namely the so-called oppositions of philosophy. This was something that Nietzsche clearly is worried about. I think he begins Beyond Good and Evil, for example, criticizing and worrying about the so-called Gegensätze of philosophy and metaphysics. And of course, Hegel is concerned with this too. But then it struck me that both of them then ended up in very different positions. The other thing that I saw as being something in common was their interest in language and the fact that whatever it means to think without or beyond the oppositions of philosophy requires a rethinking of language. Hmm. Um, in Hegel, this means developing a new type of sentence he calls a speculative sentence. With Nietzsche, it involves use of irony, metaphor, and a whole variety of other te uh, techniques. So that was really what got me going. And I was fortunate then to have the book published with Cambridge, the first book, and uh, the rest is, if you like, history. So <laughs> that's really what, what got me going. I don't know that there was one particular event, mm -hmm. but I have to say, without that seminar and without my uh, PhD supervisor, Nicholas Boyle, who's a Goethe expert, very highly regarded, I wouldn't be here doing this. So I owe everything very much to, uh, to them. Well, now you've given us a, a, an idea for having a break in 
the machine gun conscious happy hour for tea and biscuits. That can be an enticing, uh, that may be something we can practice uh, today, but I, <laughs> I do appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things that I always, I believe it's also in Beyond Good and Evil where, you know, Nietzsche is, he's constantly thinking about German identity, not just nationality, et cetera, but also the language. And he, he even kind of bemoans the fact that he's not writing in Italian, right? In this kind of allegrissimo, uh, whereas maybe German has a different rhythm to it that he he almost seems to bemoan the fact. And he also claimed to be Polish at one point. You're right, that's right. Odd, yes. <laughs> I think both of them, I mean, although they're, they're writing at slightly different times in the 19th century, both of them are concerned about German nationalism. And, I, and, and Nietzsche has this phrase, he calls himself a good European. Right. And I think Hegel is very much along the same lines. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, he read English, he could read and speak French. He read some Italian, obviously Greek and Latin. He mm -hmm. traveled a lot, unlike Kant, he traveled a lot. <laughs> and um, he does make this very important remark in the philosophy of right that citizens of the state are all equal. It doesn't matter if you are German, Italian, Protestant or Jew. You are all citizens of the state entitled to the same rights. Now, unfortunately, because of people like Karl Popper, Hegel is often associated with the polar opposite, with if right. German nationalism, at least sort of Prussian nationalism of a kind. Mm -hmm. But I think that is wrong. And and I think I think I'm right, although I'm this might be actually Nietzsche who said this, but I'm pretty sure it was Hegel who coined the phrase Deutsch tum is Deutsch dumm, which is, you know, Germanness is German stupidity. Okay. Even if Hegel didn't say that exactly, that captures something of the spirit of Hegel in certain moods. Anyway, so I think Quite a lot can be learned, not only about philosophy, but also about a strand in German thinking during the 19th century, which wasn't caught up in the strident nationalism, which, of course, got worse and worse as the century went on. I think that's quite important. And I have to say that figures like Schopenhauer also and Marx, of course, also belong to that strand of deep concern about the uh, the seamy underbelly of German nationalism. It's honestly fascinating. And it's that could be a whole podcast episode. But to stick with this question of language, which, you know, I mentioned before the show, one of the terms that has proven not only difficult to translate into English, but also to translate into French, for example, you know, Derrida kind of maybe helped to standardize the translation of Alphaben as what relevé, which is kind of a, a lifting up, but also a, but also lifting in the sense that we talk about, like lifting a quarantine or a, a statute or something like this, whereas we have this very strange term that has seemingly become standardized of sublation. And I know that Giovanni in his translation of the science of logic gives, he tries to perhaps go with suspend or some of these other ways of capturing it. But he says that in the end, he, he just reverted back to this notion of sublation. I, I was wondering if you had maybe some opinions on this difficult term, maybe if it should not even be translated, but kept in German. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on this uh, this term right well sublate which is the translation has the advantage i suppose of being strange in mm -hmm. english mm -hmm. yeah and although the word aufheben is not strange in german the right. hegel's use of it is okay so the short answer is i would keep sublate but then mm -hmm. i tend to put the german word in square brackets not in every case in which I use it, but um, rather than trying to find a better translation, because the other translation that sometimes uses supersede, mm -hmm. that's not really what's uh, what's an issue with with sublation. So for people who are not familiar with this, the word Aufheben in German, which is used by Schiller, it's used by Schopenhauer, in a philosophical context, usually means something like abolish or thoroughly negate. If you Aufheben something, you remove it from the scene. Hegel's use of it exploits sort of a threefold meaning. It does mean to negate, but it also means to preserve, like the polar mm. opposite of negating. And of course, it also means just lifting something up physically. If you pick something up from the floor, you aufheben it. And this is important because Hegel's conception of negation, as it works within the logic and the phenomenology, is that negation doesn't just leave nothing. I mean, there are forms of negation that leave nothing, but the kind of negation that, if you like, runs through Hegel's thinking is a negation that really turns what looks initially to be something that stands on its own, that has an independence, into a moment of something else, maybe right. a moment of a process. So it negates the independent of some, something. Mm -hmm. but preserves it and includes it in, let's call it, although I'd want to qualify this, 
a higher unity. Right. And so sublation captures the oddity of, of him as Hegel uses it. Now, there are, will be occasions when he might use it in the traditional sense, just to mm. mean eliminate something. But in general, I guess what I think is characteristic of Hegel's idea of of him is turning something that has an independence to it into a moment of something else. Very often into a moment of a unity of the original element plus its negation. Mm. So if you start with A, A negates itself and sort of sublates itself, hipped itself off mm -hmm. into a unity of A and not A. That's schematizing things a little bit too simplistically, but that captures what's going on. I think it's a, it's a very important term. I wouldn't use supersede. I can't remember what other terms are used to translate it. I think sublate is useful. But on the other hand, if you look up sublate, in a German, uh, an English German dictionary, it'll say Aufheben. And if you look up Aufheben, it'll say Sublate. So it's completely uninformative from that point. Yeah, of view. right. You've got to know what the word means. And I suppose you could just use Aufheben as a placeholder, but then it's probably better to have a, an English word. I mean, you have not exactly the same problem with Geist, obviously. There, I'm a little bit more on the side of spirit, unless we're talking very specifically about the minds of individuals. And then I think mind is fine. Or some horror story where maybe ghost would work <laughs> or not. I mean, th then you would have all kinds of other words, I suppose. Yes. Uh, not guys. Yes. Well, I suppose um, gespenst would be the German word for a, for a ghost or a specter. <laughs> So, you know, Mark, I don't, I don't think where Marx thinks, you know, there's a spectre haunting you. Right. It's not a geist. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. And I included in the notes that I shared with you this tracking down where maybe sublate had its other origin from this chemistry term where you're you're kind of using a gas sifted through a liquid to kind of purify the liquid from these impurities and the and the impurities rise up to this kind of skim or film on top. I wasn't sure if that's just like a bad coincidence and maybe a bad metaphor, but I do think that perhaps, you know, it's interesting that Alfaben is, we do have words like heave, we do have words like upheaval, but there's a sense in which you're right. There is something about the technical aspect of the word sublation that allows us, the strangeness of it kind of forces us to think, perhaps this, think speculatively, like you were mentioning with the speculative sentence, which I think is perhaps helpful here, because there is something speculative about in Hegel's sense, about sublation. Let me just uh, say something about the purity issue, because I think that's really important. I would say, if what you say is right about the chemical use of this term, and that that indicates almost a distilling out of what is pure, mm -hmm. I would say Hegel's use is exact exact opposite. Um, I okay. mean, one of the one of the ways you can read the logic is that it's a progressive impurification of being. You start oh, with pure being, being right. vanishes into nothing, which vanishes into being. Mm -hmm. But then the move to becoming and determinate being and beyond is a progressive loss of the purity with which you begin. Uh, yeah. um, as readers may know, if they've been able to get a little bit through Hegel and being, or, or Hegel himself for that matter, I think very strongly that Schelling's critique of Hegel is misguided. Mm -hmm. Hegel's logic is not guided by some telos. It's guided by the loss of the purity with which we begin. And this occurs at various points. Now, Aufheben, I hesitate to use the word, but just for the sake of ease of conversation, is the mechanism through which the purity is lost. Ah. And if you think mm. that when Hegel introduces Aufheben, he introduces it in the context of becoming. Now, becoming is the vanishing of being into nothing and nothing into being. And what happens in that vanishing is twofold. First of all, being and nothing in their purity become the movements of vanishing, vanishing into their other, and they become moments of that vanishing. So being proves to be hyphenated, being vanishing into nothing, and nothing proves to be hyphenated, nothing vanishing into being. And you can see in that expression, being vanishing into nothing, that being has first of all become a process. Mm -hmm. But it's also become a moment of that process. And in becoming a moment, it's lost its purity. It's no longer pure being because it's being that's inseparable from nothing. Now, that is of him. And it's generated by the purity of being. So mm -hmm. being's purity impurifies itself. <laughs> and being is then sublated into a unity with nothing. And as you go through, it seems to me, you, yes, you do get certain things that become purer, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And there are moments where purity comes back in again. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the pure one, for example. Okay. But then 
you know, you get the one becoming one of many again. So anyway, just to say, I think it's worth thinking about. Now, my background is not in Deleuze, although I have I've read a little bit of it, but I did teach Derrida for a while. And one of the points of, of common interest, it seems to me, between Hegel and Derrida is this interest in impurity. But we don't always associate that with Hegel. But I think we should. I think we, and you know, Hegel talks a lot about pure being, but pure mm-hmm. being is lost. And even when we get to the very end of the system, if you like, and we get pure thought thinking itself in its own history, we've got to remember that pure thought doesn't exist purely by itself. It exists with imagination, with mm-hmm. intuition, in an embodied form, in history, right. in a world, in a geography. And mm-hmm. so even the pure doesn't exist purely by itself. Right. And I think this is really important, Fagel, and this is all connected to this idea of, of him and, and things becoming a moment of processes or unities. I really liked how you're right. There, there is something now, seeing as we start with pure being, then there is a kind of impurification, even if that's fascinating. So I appreciate you you running with that that analogy from chemistry and and using it in that way. I think that does give a, a nice sense of not just the quote unquote beginning of the logic, but Alphaben itself. And I do think that this can then set up a little bit of perhaps I really found it fascinating when you discussed, as you mentioned earlier, the speculative sentences or this speculative use of language in Hegel and how that can be perhaps for those uninitiated or those unaware, that can be a frustrating point of starting with Hegel, is this use of the speculative sentence as you describe it, which is not kind of classical syllogisms. It's not the use of judgments, right? There's something going on where the subject and the predicate are not, so to speak, one-sided as the understanding might posit them, but there is a kind of, uh, I think the way you kind of describe it is that the What I really liked was that in normal judgments, there is a kind of two sidedness where you start with the subject and the predicate informs the subject, which then informs the predicate. Right. There is this going back and forth. But in the speculative sentence, there's kind of a unilateral, you know, one direction where there is an essence that's unfolding. But anyway, I I wanted to give you the chance to perhaps describe even from the very beginning of the doctrine of being, for example, pure being, indeterminacy, et cetera, the speculative sentence is very important for us to understand what Hegel's doing, unless we want to agree with Popper that it's all sophistry or something like this. <laughs> well, I don't want to agree. Um, <laughs> I don't either. Your listeners won't want to agree either. You know? <laughs> okay, so yes, and you're absolutely right. I think, first of all, speculative sentences do have a an important role to play in Hegel's thinking. And you're also right that they are, are best understood in contrast with judgments. I think it's worth thinking about the significance that judgment has okay. for other thinkers. And the most obvious is Kant. Kant is the thinker who is referred to most often in Hegel's logic, was hugely important to Hegel. And Kant thinks that all concepts, including categories, are predicates of possible judgments. So like the minimal activity that thought can engage in is judging. Mm-hmm. S is P, or S is not P, or mm-hmm. all S is a P, and so on. Hegel thinks that there's a problem with the very form of judgment, and it's twofold, really. First of all, it presents the subject as being something that appears to be fixed, a point of reference, to which you then attach predicates. Although the very fixity of the subject is, in a sense, I think this is what you're alluding to, in a sense is then sort of undermined by the fact that we require the predicate in order Mm -hmm. to get clear idea what the subject is. So the the subject is a fixed point of reference for the predicate, but the subject also becomes clear in and through the predicate. That's one problem. The other problem is this one-sidedness you highlight, that judgments, you know, you can say A is A or A is B. You can also say A is not B, but it's very difficult to get a dynamic A becoming B in the form of a judgment. Now, one of the things that becomes apparent in the course of Hegel's logic is that being is dynamic. It's developmental. It emerges. And so what we begin with is just the beginning. It's not a foundation. It's the beginning, pure being. And being then emerges through a series of different determinations and ultimately turns out to be what he calls the idea, reason, and then nature, and then spirit. And judgments, Hegel thinks, just aren't suited to expressing that emergence. Whereas speculative sentences are, and the way they do it is by 
presenting the subject and the predicate in a different way from the, the judgment. The point being that the predicate is not, sorry, the grammatical predicate does not simply express some kind of property of a given subject, but it articulates what Hegel calls the essence or the substance of the subject, mm -hmm. to put it in a different way. What becomes clear in the grammatical predicate of a speculative sentence is what the subject is in truth, right. what it emerges to be. So now, obviously, one speculative sentence is not going to do that either. You need a, a series of yes. speculative sentences, speculative paragraphs, mm -hmm. or speculative sections. But the idea is that if we don't think of the subject as being fixed to begin with, but we think of the subject as, if you like, extending into the predicate such that the predicate articulates what the subject is in truth, then we can understand the subject as emerging, as coming to be itself in the course of the sentence. A judgment doesn't do that. A judgment says, you know, here's a rose and it's red. Okay, well, <laughs> right. we've got the rose, we've got the object, we know what a rose is, we know it's red. Okay, we need the red to get a full handle on what the rose is, but we know what the rose is already. Whereas in speculative sentences, such as being is its own vanishing into nothing, the vanishing is not a predicate of some fixed subject that we already know. Right. The vanishing articulates what that being proves to be. And so it goes on and so it goes on. So I think speculative sentences are a linguistic form that's meant to articulate the emergence of a subject matter. And, and I comment in the book, I think, about the difference between, let's say, Hegel and someone like Leibniz on this. Leibniz, right. who I like a lot and I teach, you know, you begin the monadology with the monad is a simple substance, and at the end of the monadology, a monad is a simple substance. You know a lot more about the monad, but it hasn't changed its status. But that's not true of the logic. You begin with being, and you end with being as idea, in fact, right. being as nature. Right. And so, what being is emerges in the course of the logic in the way that it doesn't really do for Leibniz or indeed for Spinoza, for that matter. Right. And speculative sentences are the form that's, that are required to articulate that. If I can just add, there are other aspects of Hegel's language which are also designed to articulate this dynamism and that complicate the reading of Hegel. And that's, for example, the coining of verbal nouns. Becoming other than oneself, sich anders werden, which is odd for a German, it's not just odd for us, is meant to if you like, give expression in a noun, in inverted commas, of a process. Right. Now, there's a David Kolb, who has wrote a very good book on Hegel and Heidegger many, many years ago called um, The Critique of Pure Modernity, makes the point that I think Anglo-Saxons, so he includes you across the water as well as us, <laughs> have a preference for identifying individual things and thinking about the properties of them and such that even in analytic aesthetics, for example, people talk about the properties of an artwork. Mm. We like things and properties, but that's not an appropriate way of thinking about the processes that Hegel and Heidegger, for that matter, are concerned with. So both of them are interested in developing ways of speaking that reflect that dynamism within thinking. So anyway, I think it's very important that people not just be put off by Hegel's language, but ask themselves, why is he writing like this? And of course, one answer might be that he's not as clear as he could be. I mean, that's that I accept that has to be an answer. But I think there's something more deliberate. And one final point, and then I'll I'll stop this oh. point. Um, English readers obviously have the added difficulty of the translation. That one of the things that Hegel wants to do is draw upon familiar terms right. in German. And Heidegger does the same thing and use those terms to name philosophical concepts. So if we think of being in itself, an sich sein, being for itself, für sich sein, expressions like an sich are terms that Germans will use regularly. Right. We'll think of determinate being. Determinate being, Dasein, Dasein or... mm -hmm. Bestimmtheit for determinacy. The Germans will use the word bestimmt. You know, you're going into town today, bestimmt. I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we don't say, you know, are you going to town today? Well, determinately so. <laughs> Nobody would ever say that. So there is the added problem that English speakers are going to have to get through the translation to a text that is itself in German already new and difficult. If one can get over that and understand that Hegel's not just trying to do what, you know, Schopenhauer or Popper thought, sort of mystify the young, but is actually trying to express this dynamic process. So I think Hegel, I would put Hegel with Fichte, mm -hmm. with Nietzsche, with Heidegger, perhaps with Derrida, 
in those philosophers who understand that if thinking is going to be different, language has got to be different. Yeah. Whereas with greatest respect to Kant, who I, I think is one of the greatest minds ever, I don't think Kant has that same concern to reform language. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, Deleuze, the, the highest compliment he gives to Kant is this, this monstrous explosion and creation of concepts. But at the level of language that you're in identifying, there does seem to be a more, I'm not going to say a naive usage of it, but a, a more straightforward, perhaps, a, not a dialectical one or a speculative one. Not a right? dialectical. I mean, obviously, one of the things that Kant does is, is he often uses a very Latinate vocabulary, mm -hmm. whereas Fichte and Hegel try to use a more, you know, terms from ordinary German language. And I think the thing that makes Hegel different, though, is it's not just the vocabulary, it is the syntax. The yes. syntax okay. is, is different. And that's connected to this question of of speculative sentences. Because if you extend, I mean, I've presented speculative sentences as if they're very simple, just have a subject and a predicate. But of course, you can get much more long and complicated right. speculative sentences, which end up being speculative paragraphs, but mm -hmm. in which the emergence of a of a concept is articulated. And that does require, yeah, bending syntax in the way that we're we're not used to. And you brought up Heidegger, and it kind of along with this, it kind of reminded me of this meditation on the copula of, of the of the being of the is, right? There's something going on where the copula is not a simple grammatical everyday usage, right? In, in this more kind of almost like an evental uses of, of language that we might see in uh, mm -hmm. you know Eastern languages where the copula is not is not functioning in, in a kind of you know, deictic way, but there's, but as you said, there's something emergent going on. Absolutely. Where I think Hegel and Heidegger do overlap is in something slightly different. And this might also, I suppose, bring in Deleuze as well. And that is that, <laughs> that both Hegel and Heidegger, and this is where I think Hegel makes direct reference to the copula, wants to highlight the fact that people don't normally think about the meaning of is. Those of us of a certain generation remember Bill Clinton, you know, it depends what oh my god, yes, what is is. But you know, I think Hegel and Heidegger both take that seriously at a philosophical level. We we say every day this is that and such and such, and we use the copula, but we don't think about the meaning of being. And although I think Hegel wants to suspend the structure of the judgment more radically than I think perhaps even Heidegger does at the mm -hmm. beginning. So pure being at the beginning of a logic is not the copula. It's pure being. It's just, it's not even the is in a sense, it's pure being. Judgment comes in later. Nonetheless, Hegel's motivation for starting like that and for thinking about being is that people don't think about that very much. They take for granted what is means, right. along with a variety of other structures. They take for granted perhaps that there are things that have properties. They take for granted a whole manner of different categories. And not only does is being prove to be more complex and dynamic than people normally think, but actually the copula, when you look at it too, in Hegel's account of judgment, is more complex, ambiguous than it might initially appear. So yes, Hegel, as far as I know, doesn't go into the difference between the sort of apophantic copula and the, and the hermeneutical is in the same mm -hmm. way that Heidegger does. But he is interested in showing that there are deeper complexities to not only is, but other categories than we ordinarily take to be the case. Right. And that these get masked. I mean, I'm reminded because I've just been looking over the beginning of the image of thought chapter and mm -hmm. partly in preparation for this. But I'm reminded <laughs> of this, this idea that sort of everybody knows and that's exactly what Hegel's targeting. Yes, yes, everybody knows such and such, and that blinds them right. to many of the complexities that actually inform their own thinking and also inform their own being. So the fact that we're blind to the dialectic doesn't mean we're not subject to it. I don't mean to uh, to trivialize this, but my wife and I were watching, we're both great fans of The Simpsons. Okay, yeah. We watched a, um, a Simpsons episode the other night, from an early series. And anyway, uh, the long and the short of it is that Bart gets set up as a kind of model for the whole town, basically, you know, because he's an honest guy and he does what he feels. <laughs> and of course, all chaos breaks out. Um, right. And there's a very telling scene where uh you know some guy is is challenged because he hasn't fixed a rivet probably well i didn't feel like i wanted to do it something now the town suffered the dialectic that mm. was inherent 
in you know adults behaving like Bart, whether right. or not they understood it, they suffered from that kind of crazy everybody does whatever they want to. You can't stop being vulnerable to that dialectic, but you can be blind to it in the sense that you don't really think it's going to happen. And similarly, with a lot of other categories that we employ, yeah. we can use them without fully understanding their complexity, but we're still going to be vulnerable to and subject to their intrinsic logic. And I think that's one of the things that Hegel is very, very keen to bring out in the logic, to bring us to the point where we understand the complexities inhabiting the concepts we employ, but also the world we employ, the world we inhabit, sorry. And so that we, if you like, can catch up with the the dialectic that we're going to be subject to anyway, whether we like it or not. So we, we shouldn't raise BART as the the sort of, we shouldn't make that into a categorical imperative, right? Don't, don't turn it into <laughs> the maxim of the will, uh, et cetera. But uh, joking aside, and I do I really appreciate that that example you brought in. I was thinking about a number of things, but one of the things that I was thinking about is the fact that, as I mentioned before the show, I was seeing in your exposition and in looking at the logic that perhaps Hegel is actually an ally in attacking common sense and good sense, right? Because he doesn't necessarily presume what it is to think or what it is to know beforehand. And so that that kind of shifted my my gaze a little bit. But I was also thinking about how there is this sense in which you know, you mentioned the 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 downside of reading Hegel in translation, which I agree with and under and and totally feel for, especially thinking how much I, while I appreciate Strachey's translation of Freud, for example, there's still a lot of Freud can fit into one of these thinkers who uses ordinary language like Treb, and then it gets kind of turned into um, something that is almost the opposite. Maybe the upshot of Hegel in translation is precisely due to the fact of defamiliarizing ourselves. And if we can get used, if we can sort of get into that defamiliarization, it can help us to then give a step remove because what is familiar to us, as you kind of point out, maybe in passing, but in, in the opening of the book, you kind of point out that what's most familiar to us is precisely what, what we don't understand because we kind of make these assumptions and presuppositions. Yes. Although I would say you're right. Hegel writes, I think, both in the phenomenology and the logic somewhere, that what is most familiar is not thereby necessarily understood. You know, what's book right. is an air cunt. But nonetheless, I think that part of what Hegel's interested in mm -hmm. is, as you put it, defamiliarizing what we're familiar with, not simply transferring us into some alien realm where we, we don't know how to orient ourselves. But he wants us to get, he wants to get us to think differently mm -hmm. about concepts, phenomena that we are familiar with and that we inhabit. And this is the point of using words like something or finite or one and quantity and so on. So we say, oh yeah, I recognize that. I know what quantity <laughs> is. Oh, but I haven't thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. So now the problem with the translations often is that there is a risk there that one will just feel one has drifted off into some alien world. And, you know, I've, I've, I was explaining to you before we got going that I've just been finishing a, an article on, on Hegel and, and Schopenhauer, and I've been trying to be constructive in, in seeing, you know, interesting connections between them. But one of the remarks Schopenhauer makes at one point is indicative of the fact that he clearly found this stuff completely incomprehensible. Right. And he says at the end of a, a paragraph that at the end, one just sinks down exhausted. And you can imagine the poor guy struggling, not that I took, <laughs> take it he struggled for very long, but, you know, he's struggling over a couple of paragraphs and then just shaking his head and thinking, I don't know what to do. Now, the danger with the translations, I mm -hmm. think, it's not necessary, but there is a risk that one has that same experience. Whereas reading Hegel in the German or in a good translation that somehow is able to keep that connection to yeah. ordinary language, the danger is leading translation is that you do feel you're entering an, an alien realm. So this idea of defamiliarizing the familiar so that we understand the familiar more profoundly than we would otherwise do. I think is important. While you were talking, actually, just something popped into my head. And, mm -hmm. and, and I understand a lot of your listeners, obviously, are perhaps more familiar with the Lurs than the Hegel. But I thought that, that I would, this might be a point where I could just say something very, very simple about the relationship between the two of them. Because I think you're right that both 
Deleuze and Hegel, well, certainly the Deleuze of Difference and Repetition uh, mm -hmm. and Hegel, are concerned with, if you like, breaking open this sense of everybody knows that. Yes. But they go about it in different ways. Now, one of the things that struck me about Deleuze is the way in which he plays off ill will against goodwill. Yes. He talks about the struggle against an image, and he even one phrase I wrote down, talks about philosophical obstinacy. Obstinacy. Yeah. yeah. And that suggests a kind of an oppositional attitude towards goodwill and common sense and so on. Hegel's different. What Hegel mm. wants to do, because he has no agenda, at least I'm going to suggest, he has no agenda. So uh -huh. what Hegel does is rather seek to suspend our ordinary understanding of thought mm. and being. And right. this is why we begin with sheer indeterminate being. So we haven't gone at it on the basis of some oppositional principle. We've rather simply suspended our ordinary understanding of being and reduced it to sheer indeterminacy. And then the thought is that that can then build itself up and, and lead us to a deeper understanding. And so I suppose, I don't know if this is fair, but there seems to be something more polemical mm. in the way that Deleuze proceeds. And of course, for me, as a non-Deleuzean, although your listeners might not agree, there seems something deeply question-begging about what it is that Deleuze deploys against the image of thought. Yeah. Whereas I don't see Hegel as question-begging in the same way, because I think Hegel's view is to try and suspend all assumptions, whatever, yeah. about thought and being. Now, that's just, obviously, I, I appreciate that there's more to be said about the relationship between the two, but that was just one difference that struck me and I think it might also explain why it is, as you work through difference and repetition, Deleuze seems to privilege some terms over others in a way that Hegel doesn't. I mean, the most obvious one, obviously, is difference, for which identity, and I know identity does play a role in Deleuze, but identity seems to be something of an effect of difference. That may be a crude way of putting it, and I apologize if that's no, the case. No, I, I think but, that captures it. But for Hegel, that's not the case. They are equiprimordial, if you like. One doesn't have priority over the other. And I'm often wondering why Deleuze thinks that the one has to have priority. And I wonder if it's not to do with this polemic against you know, the same, because one of the features, obviously, of the image of thought is the privileging of the same, the recognition of identity. Mm -hmm. So identity, in a sense, is already a target. And sameness is already a target. Whereas Hegel doesn't have targets. Hegel's thinking, there's a problem with all assumptions. All assumptions, ultimately, as assumptions, are arbitrary. Right. Get rid of the whole lot of them. And, and where does that leave us? It leaves us with pure being. So I like to think that there's something a little bit more open-ended about Hegel's procedure, whereas I think Deleuze has something more of a polemical agenda, which then, as I say, expresses itself in the privilege that he seems to give to certain concepts over others. Now, that's just the beginning. And as I say, I'm not a Deleuze expert at all. But that's just something that struck me that it might be worth thinking about whether that's right or whether I'm missing something deeper in Deleuze. I definitely appreciate you bringing that out. And I do think that Deleuze seems to be his most polemical when it comes to, to someone like Hegel or really in this chapter that we're talking about, the image of thought chapter, Kant is, is in the crosshairs mm. even more so, even if Hegel is maybe the, the final boss of difference of repetition, but it's definitely Kant, I think that, kind of like Hegel, again, that there is a kind of the enemy of my enemy thing where Deleuze and, and Hegel, perhaps, you know, there's a kind of thing where each is the black knight of the other, which is something that um, Veronique Bergen has suggested. But, you know, I, I do think that for one thing, I see Deleuze coming closer to Hegel via someone like Adorno, because I was going to ask you, you know, Adorno has this idea about dialectics as simply being what well, he calls it negative dialectics, but it's this idea that uh, objects don't go into their concepts without some sort of leftover, some sort of residue, and that, you know, identity is, how does he put it? It's, it's basically you know, identity is kind of the falsity or the, the proof of non-identity in itself, right? It's already kind of got this dialectical, self-sublating moment. So I guess I was wondering, do you feel that Adorno perhaps remains true to Hegel in this way of characterizing dialectic? Or maybe even a more basic question, since we've talked about it, we can maybe say in terms, and I know you, you do this in your book, but uh, what we mean by dialectic or what Hegel is, has in mind, because we have kind of been talking about it, but perhaps I'll let you maybe uh, 
take that up. I will come back to the Adorno and, and remind me yes. if, I, if I forget. But on the dialectic, yeah, it might be worth saying something about that. There is um, quite a strict definition of dialectic in, I think it's paragraph 81 of the Encyclopedia Logic. And that is that dialectic is the process in which determinations, categories, although this also applies to phenomena as well, turn into their opposites. And right. they do so through themselves. So dialectic is not a relation between two independent variables. You know, I mean, people might loosely talk about a dialectic between, you know, the society and individual. That's not Hegel. Hegel's view is that dialectic is the process in which something turns into its very opposite. Being proves to be nothing. Mm -hmm. Something is the other of something else. The one proves to be one of many. Mm -hmm. The finite proves to be a moment of the infinite and, and there are a variety of others. And then we see this also later in Hegel's political philosophy. A certain conception of freedom, namely within the limits of civil society, turns into its opposite by producing poverty. And this conception of dialectic, I think, does carry over into Marx. I think Marx has a very similar conception of dialectic. To put it in a very formalistic way, what dialectic is, is the process in which A, in being A, proves to be not A. It's not interfered with by something else. It's not contaminated, as Derrida would put it, by something <laughs> other than itself. It impurifies itself. So that's what dialectic is. And this then takes a variety of different forms depending upon the particular category. So another of Hegel's claims is that the dialectic isn't a universal method. It's right. specific to the individual categories. And in not, not in every category will dialectic take that form that I've just articulated. Right. So not every category turns into its direct opposite. Now, being and nothing do. And then when we get through a bit later, there are two concepts determination and constitution that are just before you get to the section on limit, they turn into their opposites. But limit doesn't, for example. I mean, if you look at the logic of limit, where does it go? It goes into finitude. Well, mm -hmm. the finite is not the polar opposite of limit. It's a further rendering explicit. Now, there is a sort of dialectic there because limit in and of itself is generating a new category. But the new category isn't simply the opposite of the one we just had. So mm. as always with Hegel, it's important to look at his praxis not to be guided by the programmatic statements that he makes. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. dialectic in its pure form is this turning into its opposite. And Hegel thinks that this is found within thought and it's also found within life. And, you know, and he thinks that common proverbs like, you know, pride comes before the fall. That is a common everyday understanding of a dialectical relationship. He thinks it's also articulated in tragedy. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. tragedy for Hegel is the hero, or in Antigone's case, the heroine, pursuing a justified interest and destroying himself or herself in the process. By doing the right thing, you destroy yourself. Now, that is a dialectical move that tragedy articulates. But it takes a different form. So the particular dialectic that you will see in you know, the logic of the one and the many is different from what you'll get later in essence or in concept or in, in forms of nature. Now, OK, going over to Adorno, it seems to me Adorno, in common with perhaps a number of other post hegelians goes wrong in thinking perhaps that dialectic can be detached in some way from the specificities right. of the individual concepts. For Hegel, at least on my reading, there is no generic dialectic that sort of floats free of mm -hmm. the specific categories. It, it's just the, the sort of imminent life of each specific category and phenomena. Also, you can't, as it were, extract a negative dialectic unless you arrest the process of dialectic artificially. So let's pick up the theme of Aufheben that we had earlier. Aufheben is the process in which something turns itself into a moment of a unity with its opposite. Well, dialectic's is one aspect of that. Mm -hmm. So let's say being, being turns itself into its opposite, nothing. But then in that very process proves to be a moment of its unity with nothing. So dialectic, if you like, is a stage of that process of Aufhebung. Now, what you get, therefore, with Aufhebung is a continuing of dialectic beyond the idea that something turns into its opposite to the thought that it unifies itself 
with its opposite. Right. And it's only when it's unified itself with its opposite that it's lost its independence thoroughly. So the process of impurification goes beyond just becoming your own opposite. It goes towards unifying yourself with your opposite. So that means that actually, if you arrest the dialectic, have a negative dialectic that stops right. short of unity or identity, mm -hmm. actually, you don't allow the process of impurification to continue. You preserve some kind of opposition. And it seems to me this is part of the problem with Adorno, that Adorno often plays off non-identity against identity. Right. That identity, I mean, obviously, like Deleuze, he's not going to deny that, that, that identity is an important concept and it plays an important role in our world. But it, it's a problem for Adorno. Mm. It's something mm -hmm. we've got to be suspicious of. And you said yourself, we've got to be alert to what gets missed out when we think of things in terms of identity. And so you're left with an opposition still. Yeah. And I don't think Hegel is left with an opposition. I think Hegel thinks that if you follow through the dialectical sublation of concepts that initially appear to be opposed and independent of one another, if you follow that through, the logical conclusion is that they become moments of their unity with one another. And that is not, if you like, a telos that we assume at the beginning, and nor is it an indication that somehow we can't face up to the hard truth of dialectic. You know, we think dialectically and then somehow we lose faith and we want to get back to unity again. No, <laughs> unity is the result of dialectic. It's the right. result of thinking dialectic through. Now, this means that unity and identity are constitutive elements of a deeper unity with difference. Mm -hmm. Unity is the unity of unity and non-unity. Identity is identity of identity and, and difference. But it also incorporates the difference of those two as well. And my worry about Adorno is that he kind of stopped short about that because of the constant suspicion of unity and identity. It's as if we've always got to be wary and on our guard against the dangers of submerging the particularities of existence under identity. Yeah. Whereas Hegel thinks, no, that's abstract identity. And that's the identity that we lose if we follow through the dialectical process in which both one-sided identity and, and the one-sided difference get reconstituted in a new unity that includes both of them you know so i would say for me as with deleuze as with so many post hegelian thinkers they remain caught up in some of those oppositions of philosophy I and mean, this is what you know got me going at the very beginning with nietzsche i thought nietzsche too yeah for all the challenge that he brings to the oppositions of philosophy he remains caught up in many of them otherwise why would nietzsche say things like there is no being there's only becoming Right. You can only say that if you think that being isn't becoming. But Hegel's right. thought is no, being just is becoming. So <laughs> you, you can't say there's no being, there's only becoming if yeah. you understand that being proves to be becoming. Now, I don't know that Nietzsche's got that thought. And mm -hmm. similarly, you can't say that we should be skeptical of identity and privileged non identity if you recognize that both of them actually turn out to be moments of a unity with one another. Now, I realize this is all very abstract and perhaps rather oversimplifying, but that does kind of express my worry that I would have about Adorno, Nietzsche, and Deleuze. Which you got me thinking of, you quote this really nicely succinct part of the Encyclopedia Logic where Hegel says the logical has three sides, the side of abstraction or of the understanding, but then you have the dialectical or negative, negatively rational side, but you also have, as you're pointing out, the speculative or positively rational side, right? So you know, they are, these are the three moments of everything real, right? So you have to, as you're emphasizing, there is that speculative aspect that would constitute the positive side, if you will, and leaving that out would then stop short at opposition and not get us yeah. to... to or, or it stops short of dialectic, which then does have a negative character, because obviously dialectic on its own is yes. negative. Right. In that it's the process of something turning into its opposite and so losing itself. But in a way, it's not losing itself enough because to genuinely lose yourself is not to kind of give way to your opposite. 
it's to become unified with your opposite. So neither is purely itself anymore. Yeah. Now, this is, I can give you two examples, I think, that would show what's meant by this. One is very abstract. That's from the beginning of the logic. And one is from the philosophy of right. At the beginning of the logic, we have pure being and pure nothing passing into one another. Mm -hmm. And becoming is the passing of being into nothing and nothing into being. Now, what's interesting about becoming is that it is both the loss of being and nothing and the preservation of being and nothing. Right. Because it's being vanishing into nothing and nothing vanishing into being. So each proves to be its own vanishing, but into what? Right. Into the other. So the difference between the two is bizarrely preserved in the very movement in which it's lost. Now, the move into Dasein, determinate being, involves a more thorough undermining of the purity of being and nothing. So they don't just vanish into one another, but they vanish into a unity in which each is just a moment in relation to the other. In the philosophy of right, and you might think it's a bit of a jump, but I'll try and explain it, in Hegel's account of civil society, before we get to the corporation and the state, we have, again, something of an opposition between the sphere, if you like, of economic individuals yep. and the public authority. So the, the realm of the particular and the realm of the universal. Now, if one can get stuck there, and one might argue that many modern societies have got stuck there. You know, we, mm. we have a realm of what we call economic freedom, which is overseen by a regulative authority of some kind. But Hegel thinks, actually, to take that further is to recognize that, in fact, the universal and the interests of the particular have to become one, mm -hmm. such that individuals in their activity have to be informed by a concern for the universal for other people. And this is what happens, first of all, in the corporation and in the state. So the state is no longer simply an external authority like the public authority, but it is both a sense of common citizenship within individuals. It informs individuals. So right. individuals are no longer just individuals. Yes, they're individuals, but they're also individuals as citizens with shared identities. And then the state is also at the same time, obviously, an authority as well. Now, that's quite important. The move from having a, a sphere of universality that's set over against individuality to a position in which that very in universality informs individuality, yeah. that I think is an example of a more radical undermining of the separateness of universal and particular and integrating them into one. And so ethical life in its fully developed form in the corporation or the state is no longer marked by the opposition between my personal interests and the interests of the universal, because the two are meant to coincide. I'm meant to get my personal satisfaction through satisfying the interests of all, and the interests of all are satisfied through my getting my personal interests. Whereas right. obviously in civil society, you know, there's a tension between them. I can do what I want, but I've got to be careful. The state you know, has got to regulate my activity so that I don't start harming others. Well, that should yield to a situation where my own personal interest becomes an interest in the interest of all. Right. That in wanting what I want, I want the welfare of all. Now, I think that is a very concrete example of the way in which an opposition can be more thoroughly undermined by giving way to a unity of those two opposed moments. Now, obviously, if you're Marx or you're Adorno, you're going to be suspicious of that structure of the state. But I think <laughs> that often that's generally because they misunderstand what Hegel's got in mind there. I mean, obviously, Marxists are going to disagree with this. But I don't know if that, that concrete example helps a little bit, but uh, I find that a useful way of thinking about giving flesh to this rather more abstract, logical movement. I think it does help in it, and it kind of informs the example you brought up of Bart, right? Where Bart would be that, yes. you know, stopping short of this unification uh, and, you know, dissolving back into kind of a sheer individuality of, of not caring about about others and and being with others, kind of like would... the caricature of Sterner, I think. <laughs> but what you were just describing, Stephen, just kind of reminded me a little bit of maybe like the opposition between Sterner and Hegel. But I think there is maybe still some kind of reconciliation there because ultimately, I think he is making that same or trying to make that same move to dissolving into the other. I think that's a big part of it. But I 
really couldn't articulate it at, at the level to make it, you know, I just want to interject that really quickly, perhaps for the audience. But are you thinking of the the union of egoists type? Kind of. of that... Yeah. But um, it's sort of like it's almost like individuality to its going all the way through individuality to come out the other side of a universal kind of in this relationship that Stephen was just going over. But I, I don't know if I can really provide much more insight yeah, if, or, or value there. If you don't mind, I'm going to deflect this a little bit away. <laughs> sure. From yeah, no, please. Uh, towards Mark. Because sure, I, okay. think, I think there are significant differences between oh, for sure. Hegel and Marx. But I think what they have in common is the following, that both are concerned about the negative consequences of a society that's basically constructed on the basis of an opposition between particular interests and universal interests. Now, I think Hegel thinks that that is found in what he calls civil society, and in particular in the opposition between, as I say, the, the sphere of economic activity, economic individuals going about their activity and satisfying their needs, and the public authority which regulates them. For Marx, then you might say it's the sphere of capitalism over against the state. And I think both of them want to, if you like, bring back the universal within the sphere of the particular so that our universal, so that our particular activity actually becomes an activity for the benefit of all. It's just that in Hegel's mind, that doesn't mean eliminating the political structures of the state. Whereas obviously for Marx, it does, because mm -hmm. Marx thinks that the very, it's not just the opposition between, if you like, the capitalist economic structure and the mechanism of the state. It's not just that opposition that's the problem. The political structures of the state themselves are an expression of the very alienation within capitalist production and exchange, whereas Hegel doesn't think that's right. Hegel thinks there is a logical necessity for political institutions. If, if you like, there is a sphere, a legitimate place for political freedom, where you could ask, or you could suggest rather, that for Marx there isn't, that the idea that there is a separate space for political freedom, in a sense, is an expression of the alienation within capitalism. But nonetheless, leaving that difference aside, I think the idea of, if you like, bringing back the concern for the universal into our particular activity, such that our particular activity is informed by a concern for the universal, is really important. Now, there's an interesting counterpart to both of them, in Schopenhauer that I've just I've just been looking at because Interesting. Schopenhauer also, in common with Hegel, uses the term recognizing oneself in the other. It's quite striking when you when you read it. He thinks that ethics, compassion, is recognizing oneself in the other. But the self that I recognize is not my individual self. It's a kind of universal self. What I mm. recognize in the other is the same suffering universal will in all right. of us. It's not individual. It's not particular. So for Schopenhauer, to move to compassion, which is the basis of ethics for him, is really to give up a concern for my own individuality, which for Schopenhauer is irredeemably egoistical. Mm -hmm. Now, I think Hegel and Marx thinks, no, that's not right. Interest in oneself is not irredeemably egoistical. It can become a personal pursuit of one's own satisfaction, which at the same time is also interested in the welfare of others. And so the particular and the universal become, you know, aligned, they inform one another. And this is not to overlook the differences between Hegel and Marx at all. I mean, there are very striking differences, but I do think they have that in common. And my thought is that that unifying of the particular and the universal is a much more radical undoing of the opposition between particular and universal than a kind of position of constant vigilant skepticism over against the universal. My worry about someone like Adorno is that we've still got that moment of identity, that moment of universality. It's just constantly an object of suspicion, yeah. something we've got to be careful about, we've got to be wary about. Whereas in a way for Hegel and Marx, no, there's, there's somewhere else you can go. You can integrate the particular and the universal in a much deeper way. And that I think that's more fruitful, more true to what it is to be human. And I may be doing a huge injustice to Adorno by saying that, but I am worried <laughs> that this is this is where Adorno leaves us, leaves us in this sort of oppositional, as I say, vigilance. 
because there's no other form of identity that you can have. See, what in a sense both Marx and Hegel are thinking is that it's possible to have an abstract universal and it's possible to have a concrete universal. Mm. And a concrete universal is one that is animated by and coextensive with the particular. I don't know whether Adorno really recognizes that you can have such a thing as a concrete universal, a concrete identity. Maybe he can, maybe there are listeners out there who will say to me, you look, you're wrong. Adorno can have that, in which case I'm pleased. But my worry is that he can't see that. And so Adorno thinks that identity and universality remains abstract. And for that reason, something we've got to be suspicious of and vigilant towards. Right. This is great. And it and it kind of informs a little bit of, you know, Nietzsche's debt to Schopenhauer, where he is also very suspicious of, you know, altruism, where it's ultimately proven to be you know, egoistical, right? There's something there of Schopenhauer's, you know, suspicions that gets carried over into into Nietzsche's, you know, hermeneutics of suspicion or whatever. I wanted to tell you one of the things that really uh, shot out to me was two things. First, and I'll preface it with the critics, you mentioned from um, sort of, Schelling uh, on on up and others really Schelling was and you mentioned him earlier kind of informed some of the later the post Hegelians in this idea that at the quote unquote beginning because that's a whole topic of its own of the logic it is as though being vanishing into nothing and nothing vanishing into being is a product of thought or our thinking whereas that's precisely as you show very painstakingly that's precisely not the case that it's not some sort of Kantian for us, for my thinking, that this goes on, but that it's inherent in the things themselves, in the pure being, in the indeterminacy itself, not in and not as a product of thinking. Even if sometimes Hegel may have here or there, like in the encyclopedia, had had certain things that you point out that could have been grabbed onto in other places uh, elsewhere. He's very clear that this is not the case. And I think that what I appreciated about that was the fact that you bring out very strongly that when we consider what the philosopher's activity is, on the one hand, there is this passivity of thinking where we're mm. really kind of like in the etymological idea of speculation. It's about an observing and inspection and the things are doing the activity. But if there is an activity of the thinker, you make it very clear that it's in the suspensive moment. It's the suspending of the assumptions and the presuppositions. So there's a kind of active passivity, if you will. You can respond to any or all of that, just thinking about um, this beginning, if you will, with being in nothing and not adding our kind of thought to make being vanish into nothing and vice versa. If I can respond by maybe saying a little bit about Hegel's method, as I understand it, Mm -hmm. Bill Maker, who who sadly passed away um, mm. a year or so ago, would sometimes say, you know, Hegel has no method, <laughs> kind of very polemical way of putting it. And, and I'm kind of sympathetic to that in that there isn't in Hegel's logic a prescribed set of rules that one has to follow. Mm. Although there have been Hegel scholars who have tried to suggest that maybe the structure of the concept, you know, universal, particular and individual, gives a sort of method according to which everything has to then follow. But I'm sympathetic to Maker's idea that there isn't such a thing. But that doesn't mean to say that there isn't a method that we follow and that there isn't a method that, if you like, the system follows on its own. I think you're right that the method that we follow begins at least with this idea of suspending assumptions. That is clearly something that we have to do. I think Hegel is acutely aware of the fact that we inhabit a historical situation. We are in modernity. The background to our thinking is one of modern states that are more or less, in some cases less, embodiments of freedom. We've just had the French Revolution. We've got Rousseau, we've got Fichte, all promoting freedom. We've got, further back, we've got the Reformation. So there's a clear context there. But nonetheless, this is a context in which if we're going to think critically and freely Mm -hmm. and not just take things on authority, we have to suspend our assumptions. So that's clearly an activity that we engage in. I also want to then say that we've got to do a bit more when we work through the logic. We have to, and this might sound banal, but I think it's very important given 
particularly what Schelling says about Hegel, that Hegel, you know, Hegel's thinking is all a bit vague, ungefair, mm. it's sort of roughly this and that. Okay. Hegel thinks that the progression through the logic requires precision. Right. It requires paying very precise attention to what is explicit in each category mm-hmm. and focusing on that and highlighting the differences. Now, many published commentators often can't tell the difference between one concept and another. And there are similarities. The structure of something is very close to the structure of the one, but mm. they are different. And I think part of what we have to do, what we have to do, is pay close attention to what those differences are. And then the last bit of our activity, I think, is this idea of rendering explicit. Brandon talks about making explicit. Now, I, right. I have big problems with Brandon's reading of Hegel, but I think this idea that Hegelian thinking involves making explicit what's implicit is absolutely right. I think I have a different understanding of what Hegel means by that, but I think that's right. So I think that then what we do is having focused on the specifics of a particular category, what we are doing, our activity, consists in making explicit what's implicit in that explicit structure. And it's really that that takes us forward to a new concept and category. Now, right. the new category is made necessary by what is implicit in the previous one. So right. in a sense, we're not contributing any content. We're not saying, well, okay, this one doesn't work. Oh, how about this one? Or saying, well, I don't like this concept. Let's try this one. All we're doing is bringing out what's implicit and making that explicit. To give an example, if I can, maybe this is not the most well-known section, but the transition from determinate being to something. Hegel thinks that we start with being, being proves to be nothing, that then collapses into what he calls determinate being or being determinate, being Mm. this, not that, being real, not negative. But then he thinks that if we make explicit what's implicit in that structure, we get the idea of self-relating being, of being something, being an it, being an itself. And so ultimately, to be will will mean to be something. And where do we see that? Well, if we take the relationship between reality and negation, and what we've got there, in fact, is a relationship between two different forms of Dasein, between determinate being is relating to itself in that very difference. Right. So implicit in that difference is a relation of Dasein to itself. Self-relating determinate being is implicit in determinate difference itself. We then make that explicit, and so we get a new thought namely that to be is to be something, and to be something is to relate to another. And it goes on through that one, go through the rest of it, but it goes on. Now, I think that is something that we do. I would say there's a parallel in the phenomenology when we move from the end of one shape of consciousness to a new one. Okay, sense certainty, perception, whichever shape it is, goes through its experience and comes out at the end with a different object from the one it thought it had. We, the phenomenologists in this case, make explicit precisely what that new object amounts to. And that then becomes the object for a new shape. So if we think at the end of sense certainty, which people might be familiar with, sense certainty begins wanting its object to be this, here, now, simple immediacy. And as we go through it in the experience of sense certainty, the object proves to be complex, you know, a, mm-hmm. a complex of many here's or a plurality of now's. This, what this very much kind of reminds me of what Freud does, I think. It, it almost seems to kind of track his sort of move into kind of making these latencies within consciousness become explicit or these making the... Ex- yes, yes. But go on, sorry. Uh, well, and he kind of historicizes uh, a bit too there. So I don't know. That's kind of where I see the sort of similar trajectory I suppose with Hegel's method. might be is that making explicit has a transformative role as well. So Mm. we're not just, and this is why I'm worried about this word already at times that I think, Taylor, you made mention of it at one point. And and Hegel himself makes mention of this, actually. He says that the method of philosophy is is positing what's already in a concept. But one's got to be a little bit careful because the whole language of the already, I think of Heidegger, the Yishung, we're, we're teasing out what's already at work. There is, for me... This may seem a jump to your listeners, but the whole language of the already for me is a kind of language of the quasi transcendental. It's mm-hmm. thinking about what's already there as a kind of condition for where we want to go. Right. Now, right. I think Hegel's thinking isn't quite in alignment with that. What we do when we make 
explicit what's implicit is we do bring out a structure, but we also thereby come upon something new. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, in the move from Dasein or determinate being to something, we are bringing out a self relation that's implicit in determinate being, but being something is not reducible to being determinate. Mm -hmm. And being determinate isn't yet being something. And similar at the end of sense certainty, the complexity that sense certainty ends up with as its object isn't yet the thing with multiple properties that is the object of perception. But when we make explicit as phenomenologists all that all that's implicit at the end of sense certainty, then what pops out is the thing with properties. So that transformative element, I think, is also there in the process of making explicit. And that's why. Hegel's, even though he does say that philosophy is analytic in one sense, it's not analytic in a Kantian sense. So we can't say that every single category in the logic is already contained in pure being. It's not. It's implicit in pure being in that if you follow the dialectic of pure being and make explicit what's implicit in its various stages, you will end up with all those categories. But that's different from saying that, you know, I don't know, essence, for example, is already there in being. I don't think it is. Now, I'm not enough, I'm not familiar enough with Freud to know whether that transformative activity also happens when you make explicit sort of latent meanings. Um, so that might be a point of difference. So you will know that better than I am. But I think it's important to think that for Hegel, at least, the development that occurs through making explicit what's implicit produces new concepts. New concepts don't need to be created a la Deleuze. They emerge when we make explicit what's implicit in previous ones. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, and that, that is a good point of uh, difference there to, to bring out that concept creation would not necessarily be in the same, it wouldn't be understood sort of at all in the same sense in which Deleuze is thinking of it a la, you know, problematics or as he calls no. it once, the, the propedeutics of, of reason you know, versus, uh, or the pedagogy of reason, I, I apologize, versus what he might claim Hegel is doing, which is an encyclopedia, there might be some differences there. But I do think that you point out very well how I kind of screenshotted a little paragraph from Badu's being an event. And your work made clear that actually, there are some problems with saying that what he says, it would not be an exaggeration to say that all of Hegel can be found in the following, the still more is imminent to the already, everything that is is already still more. But he even gets wrong this notion that Hegel starts with determinateness when in fact he mm -hmm. does it. It's very clear, you make this explicit, but it's very clear that he starts with indeterminacy or indeterminate being, not with determinateness. So that's already wrong. But then to have said that the, you know, that the still more is imminent to the already, that seems like if you say that, it's only, again, from this retrospective derivation, as you bring out when you talk about the beginning and the end of the logic, it's only, there is a progressive derivation of, perhaps, of the idea, and there's this retrospective derivation, but that's not there at the beginning. We can't, that's, that would just be an assumption. That would be another telos to ascribe yeah. to Hegel, which I think is one of the things that comes out a very common from a lot of philosophers is they find this teleology in Hegel, which if it perhaps develops and we can see that retrospectively, it's not there at the beginning. I think you're absolutely right. That is exactly right. And I mean, maybe Hegel's him guilty himself of sort of misleading his readers. Okay. <laughs> because he does at one point refer to the development in the logic as the movement of being, mm -hmm. but then he also calls it you know, the self-movement of the concept or the self-movement right. of the idea. However, it is clear that at the beginning of the logic, we don't know that there will be an idea. And I think it's very important. I mean, one of the phrases I use, I don't know if I use it consistently enough, but I try to use it, is that what Hegel is doing in the logic is thinking pure being and seeking to determine what categories, if any, emerge from being. The thought there being that you can't assume that the very at the very beginning that there will be others because you don't know at the beginning that the beginning is the beginning of anything <laughs> you, the whole point of suspending assumptions is that you've just got being you only know that it's the beginning when you've begun and further things have developed 
And so I think that's really, really important. Now, the idea of the two perspectives, yes, this was something where uh, that I'm very close to Angelica Nutzo in thinking it's important to distinguish between the thoughts that Hegel presents on method at the beginning of the logic and at the end. And just very briefly, if people are thinking about Hegel's method and they go to the very end of the logic, which is an obvious place to go because that's where Hegel explicitly thematizes method, I think it's important to recognize there that what he's thematizing is method viewed from the end. And so the distinction that Hegel draws and that Nutzo picks up on between a beginning and a progress and a sort of result, you can only know that method involves those stages when you've already gone through the imminent development, so that in fact that you know that there will be a progress from the beginning to a result. Now, at the beginning, you don't know that there's going to be a result. And the assumption that the result is already somehow prefigured in the beginning, which it seems to be implicit what Badiou is saying, that the still more is, is already there, yeah. that the result is already there. Surely what that would do is just build in an assumption, a presupposition into the very beginning. But if you're trying to think without presuppositions, you can't do that. So at the beginning, you can't assume dialectic, you can't assume the law of non-contradiction, but also you can't assume that you're at the beginning of a development that's going to end up with the idea. And so the way I try and distinguish these two methods, the method from the point of view of the beginning and the method from the point of view of the end, is that the method that we follow as we go through the logic is imminent in the way that I've tried to describe, that yes, we're active in making explicit what's implicit, but in doing that, we're simply, you put it nicely, we, we are sort of, our very activity is enabling us to passively follow the dialectic that's generated by the categories, and the whole thing is imminent. And indeed, we do go through quality, quantity, measure, essence, concept, idea. When we get to the end, of course, we know that being is proved to, has proven to be idea. So then we can say, looking back at the whole, that that imminent development was, in fact, the method of the idea. It was the emergence of the idea or the concept. And we can then look back at the beginning and say, well, the beginning was implicitly concept. And mm. as we go through, we can determine stages on the way to being fully explicitly concept or idea. But of course, at the beginning of the whole thing, you don't know that being is implicitly concept. You only know that at the end when you've got to the concept. So the perspective changes. And I think this is cast light on another term that you highlighted in your, in your notes, and that is the idea of philosophy as a circle. I think there is a sense that philosophy is a circle for Hegel, but it doesn't start out as a circle. Right. You don't know at the beginning that it's a circle. It proves to be a circle, but it only proves to be a circle if you don't assume it to be one at the beginning. Because the only way you can get to the end perspective, which then looks back at the beginning as the prefiguring of the end, the only way you can get to that perspective is through the imminent development in which the end is not presupposed. Right. You have to begin with that presuppositionless imminent development to mm -hmm. get to an end, which allows you to look back at the beginning, which you can then see as the prefiguring of the end. Excellent. So that's, that's secondary. I remember many, many years ago, Robert Benesconi saying, and I hope he won't, if he's listening, he won't mind me uh, reminding him of this. That, he, doesn't, he doesn't like that, podcasts, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, all right, okay that the phenomenology is a book you can never read for the first time. You know, in a sense, you always already have to have read it in order to read it. Now, I say, no, 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 no. That, that, that's got to be wrong. <laughs> you know, you've got to read it for the first time and through the logic in order to be able to have that retrospective view. Right. So, um, so I hope that helps. So by all yeah. means, readers, look at what Hegel says about the method at the end, mm -hmm. but don't take those remarks as explaining what's happening as we get to that point. Because no, if you yeah. do take it that way, then you're going to be buying in to, I suppose, the teleological reading that people like Schelling and implicitly, it seems to be bad you have. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be to miss something distinctive about uh, Hegel's uh, method. Yeah, I mean, if I had to correct Badu or put Hegel in Badu's language, you know, Hegel doesn't start with determinateness, but he starts with the empty yeah. set. He starts with the void in a certain sense, right? You know, with the indeterminacy of being and nothing. So that's a whole nother conversation. I would suggest, since you brought up the phenomenology, and this is a lighthearted question, and I'm just kind of curious, it does seem the phenomenology of spirit gets all the rage and all the press. Mm -hmm. 
as you've kind of mentioned yourself, do you have any opinions on perhaps, I mean, because they're roughly this about the same amount of pages. I mean, the phonology itself is <laughs> 450, 500 or so. And what the lot, so the logic's I mean, longer. The logic is longer, but not significantly longer. I mean, maybe a little bit, but uh, do you have a, you have an, any ideas about perhaps why the phenomenology seems to be to get all of the, the interest or at least the focus, whereas the big logic and, and sometimes the encyclopedia logic gets, I mean, I feel like that was my access to Hegel was the encyclopedia logic, which is mostly lectures, but it felt a little bit more accessible, perhaps for a first time read of Hegel. But there's something about the greater logic that perhaps doesn't get as much press. I think you're right. The encyclopedia logic is perhaps the easiest one to deal with because yes. um, that is basically an extended handout. So it was published. It was written by Hegel, but it was used as the basis for lectures. OK, um, the three editions, 1817, 1827, 1830 and Hegel. And, and it, it presents the whole system, the architectonic of the whole system. But it the was outline. basically used for lectures. But the thing to remember about it is that it doesn't give you all the detailed transitions. And so it gives you the highlight. It's, you know, it's like. I'm a great, uh, you know, uh, football fan. That's, that's yeah. our football, not what you call football. And, uh, you know, there's a program here called Match of the Day, which comes on every Saturday night, which I'll be watching later on this evening. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the highlights, basically, yes. you know, gives yeah. you the best bits and the goals. Now, the encyclopedia is somewhat like that. It's kind of the highlights, the, the main stages, and it misses categories out. So it is accessible, and it has, particularly with the additions, which are inserted by Hegel's editors on the basis of, of his lecture notes. There's okay. a lot of very rich material there. So I quite agree with you. And as a way into Hegel, it's fine, but it doesn't give you the detailed working out of the argument. The difference between phenomenology and logic, well, I suppose, first of all, I would say the logic isn't necessarily as neglected as one might think. Okay. Schelling clearly looked at it. Kierkegaard did. Marx, I mean, the parts of the logic of being for self, which go into Marx's doctoral dissertation, which are very important. Lenin has, I was able to go back over to uh, to East Berlin before the, the Berlin Wall fell. And you couldn't do very much apart from buy records and buy books. So I, I bought lots <laughs> of books, including Lenin's remarks on, on Hegel's logic. Now, they're not all that illuminating, to be honest, but, <laughs> but it shows that he has read through quite a lot of mm. the logic. Gadamer knew Hegel's logic, Heidegger did, Derrida did. So there has actually been sort okay. of running under the surface an interest in Hegel's logic, McTaggart. Mm -hmm. But the phenomenology clearly, and I suppose one has to say, it's because it's so much more dramatic and it actually dramatizes yeah. Yeah. Uh, various forms of consciousness, you know, the mm -hmm. unhappy consciousness, the master slave dialectic, Antigone, and so on. And, you know, you've got to think of the impact of Kojève and then Hippolyte and Sartre as well. So I suppose there are historical reasons why the phenomenology has as a higher profile. And my own feeling is that they are both very important. And I don't yes. know if I can just very briefly say something about how I take them to be related. Phenomenology First of all, I think one needs to, needs to recognize that phenomenology for Hegel is a discipline and it's not philosophy. So from my mm -hmm. point of view, Hegel's phenomenology is not part of his philosophy. It is a phenomenology. And what I mean by that, it's not answering like the what is question. It's not telling us what is being, what is nature, what is spirit and so on. It's giving an account of the experiences that are made by shapes of consciousness that take the world to be a certain way. And so it is phenomenological. It's not Husserl's phenomenology, because it's not looking at sort of quasi-transcendental structures, but it is looking at specific experiences generated by taking an object to be a certain way. And it connects the two. And it eventually leads from the standpoint of self-sense certainty to what he calls absolute knowing, which is meant to be then the beginning of the logic itself. And I think that's a very important discipline. I think there's a lot of absolutely fascinating stuff in there. Going back to what we were talking about, Bart Simpson earlier, there's, there's a mm -hmm. very important uh, section on the law of the heart, which is not exactly Bart Simpson, but it's basically, you know, the law of the heart. Each heart thinks that it's got a sort of hotline to the truth. And that's fine as long as all the hearts agree. But what happens if one heart doesn't agree with another heart? And yet each is completely convinced that it's got the truth within its heart. I mean, it's, there's some fascinating dynamics that go on within the phenomenology. But because I don't think that the phenomenology sets out Hegel's own position, it sets out rather what he thinks happens within other positions 
in virtue of the way that they take the world to be. I think the logic has to have priority because the logic sets out what Hegel takes being to be. It's an underdetermination of the world in that it doesn't yet take account of nature and history. But nonetheless, it is an important articulation of the fundamental categories and forms of being. So if I were to choose, I'd have to go with the logic as being primary, because then you're in Hegel's system, then you're discovering what he thinks. But would I get rid of the phenomenology? No, absolutely not. I think it's an absolutely fantastic book. It's yeah. very hard to read. I and mean, there are some even mm-hmm. passages as familiar as the master-slave dialectic, if you drill down into individual sentences. It's quite difficult to make sense of, but I think <laughs> it's a great study. Excellent. This is uh, very excellent. I do have to get my my charger, but this might be a sign that we can we can wrap up. Obviously, we scratched the surface, but I think we got into at least how to enter into preparation for reading the logic. And so what I would like to do then is perhaps give you a chance to say some final thoughts and also mention what you have just been working on, like the Schopenhauer Hegel piece, but also your plans for continuing on making explicit what is going on in logic, for example, your volume on the doctrine of essence. So this will kind of be your forum to uh, perhaps tell us what we can expect from you in the very near future. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you too and to your audience about Hegel and, and other matters. It's been, uh, it's been great fun. I don't know if everybody out there realizes this, but the life of an academic isn't you know, 100% wall-to-wall talking about Hegel or whatever it is. It's a lot of solitary thinking and, and marking essays. And so occasions like this are um, very rare and, and much appreciated. And so I hope you've all found it to be interesting. But what am I going to do in the future? Well, Yes, I am going to go on and, and work on the logic of essence. I've done a number of essays on the beginning and also on the end of, of the logic of essence on the modal categories on substance and, and causality. And so my hope is to try and then produce a book within, I don't know how long it's going to take, but the next few years, explaining as clearly as I can what Hegel is doing in the logic of essence. And then also, if I can do this, relating it to other philosophers, I suppose mm-hmm. obvious examples would be Schelling, Fichte, Kant, Aristotle, Spinoza, possibly Leibniz, um, Marx, and then maybe if Marx. I've still got any? If I've, <laughs> yeah, if I've still got any energy left, then obviously the logic of the concept will come too. I guess what motivates me in doing all of this is mm-hmm. um, a couple of things. First of all, I think the logic is absolutely worth studying, but it is not high up on the reading lists of most university philosophy courses in a way that you would expect most philosophers to know a bit about Aristotle and Plato and Descartes and Kant. They're not expected to know about Hegel. And I think they should be expected to know about Hegel, but obviously they need to be helped. So I'm hoping that and I'm not alone. You know, there are a lot of other people writing in English and in German and in French and in Italian and in Dutch. We're, we're all working towards the same goal of trying to make Hegel's logic intelligible and trying to bring out its relevance. So that's what I'm going to be doing. The work I have been doing recently, well, I'm just finishing this article on Hegel and Schopenhauer, which is not comprehensive, but it's trying to respond to some of the things that Schopenhauer said, particularly Mm -hmm. about Hegel and philosophy of nature. Before that, I completed an essay on Hegel and comedy, which is very close to my heart. So I had the privilege of being able to read every single one of Aristophanes' plays. And before that, I wrote something on Hegel and the philosophy of nature, and before that, I did a paper in um, honor of Terry Pinkett, which, will, which has come out actually with, uh, with Routledge on Hegel and poverty. And one of the things I, I like doing is sort of spreading myself across different, uh, different areas in Hegel's work. And then wherever possible, you've mentioned this a little bit, relating Hegel to, if it's Spinoza or Kant or Marx, sort of bringing him into dialogue with others. Another thinker, actually, who might appear at some point, although I'm not making any promises, in the essence chapter is, of course, Deleuze, because I'm, there are aspects of Deleuze that seem to me closer to what Hegel's doing in the logic of essence than perhaps elsewhere. But as I say, I'm not making any promises. Uh, <laughs> just, you know, time is not necessarily on my side. That's the, uh, the plan for the future and what I've been doing recently. That sounds like a lot, and that's excellent. I know that Henry Henry uh, piqued my interest when he said that you know you're either in writing or perhaps in confidence to him that you made this interesting claim that Deleuze perhaps stops at the doctrine of essence. So that would I know that would be a whole episode, and perhaps we could see that uh, that thought elaborated if 
if he was correct in his recollection of a comment you may have made, or or maybe you've said that in, in writing before, that would be a whole episode on its own. But so obviously, I'm excited to hear about what you're writing. And you say time is not on your side, but with the energy you have, you know, the spirit of youth is very much alive in you. And I just can't tell you how much I appreciated you coming on the show, talking with us, teaching I do believe this was very much, I learned a lot about Hegel from your work then. And, and it actually helped me to get rid of some presuppositions that I had, not just from Deleuze, but uh, in general, from many other thinkers, as we mentioned. And so I think in that sense, because I am not just, I don't consider myself a Deleuzean, but I have a very, I have a passion for what we call continental philosophy, especially French continental philosophy. I think it's important, very much important to go back and be able to learn from Hegel and those who have studied Hegel, because I think that it will help to inform so many of the other thinkers that I'm interested in. So we both just really appreciate your time and generosity. And, um, you know, as you're getting closer to finishing the Doctrine on Essence, maybe sometime next year, love to have you back and do this again. First of all, thank you very much for your kind remarks. I mean, what you said there is really, really important. If anything comes out of this conversation, it would be lovely if it were simply that people get rid of some of the assumptions they've got about, about yeah. Hegel. It doesn't mean they've all got to agree with what Hegel says, but just right. think differently. In a sense, you know, get rid of the image of Hegel that unfortunately Deleuze didn't get wrong. Deleuze had an image <laughs> of Hegel. Let's yes. get rid of that. I wouldn't, as I say, hold your breath. I don't think it'll be next year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I would be delighted to come back. Uh, sometime. Excellent. And yes, you are right. Henry is right. I have written about this in an article, but also I've, I've talked about this. I do have some thoughts about why I think that Deleuze is perhaps, well, stuck is perhaps an, rather than an ungenerous word to use, but, <laughs> but, but he gets too caught up in okay. what Hegel would think of as the thinking of essence. So maybe okay. that would be something we could talk again. I'd be delighted to come back in future. Excellent. Uh, meanwhile, I wish you all the very best to you and to your audience. And thanks very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Excellent. Well, uh, enjoy the highlights. Uh, you know, I, I do think. <laughs> yes. I do who, think who, do you, who do you support? I am a lifelong Manchester United Manchester supporter. United. I Excellent. Was, Excellent. I was born up in the northeast of England, but I, I lived my, my you know formative years just outside of Manchester. And I went to see my very first game in November 1963. So it was a long, oh, wow. long time ago. <laughs> I can still remember it. And so nice. I followed them over years, the glory years and the not so glorious years. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, I think that there's something to the analogy you made between the encyclopedia logic being the highlights or the outline, whereas <laughs> in the logic you have the transitions. But, you know, the exciting part of watching a soccer game, and I know it, for those who, who may think it's boring, they probably haven't played it or, or really watched yeah. it, but it is it is in the possession and the transitions of possession. Right. Yeah, there's a very Hegelian aspect it, to it, I think. That's right? exactly right. Yeah, so if you're, it's kind of like, I know people who, who find baseball boring, and that's fine, but a lot of it for me is the the logic, if you will, the strategy that the pitcher has and the catcher in dealing with different batters. So it's the same thing with, with possession. That's where the excitement goes on, and that's very much different from a game like basketball or football, where really well, it is. I mean, it's not really, honestly. It's well, all about it's all about space. It's that's about true. finding mm -hmm. the, it's about, the movement of the whole and the spaces mm -hmm. that that opens up. And that's where you strike is to, it's about mm -hmm. that kind of gelatinous, you know what I mean? Kind of, kind of movement. But anyways, while we're on football, just before you, before you sign yes. off, I've got to tell you one little story. And that please, was, um, Manchester United have had a series of managers since Alec Ferguson resigned. And one of them was Jose Mourinho, who is very well known in Europe. Anyway, Jose Mourinho suffers from second season syndrome that he does very well in his first season and not so well in the second season. And he was interviewed about this and he <laughs> quoted Hegel. Really? In, in, in yes, I remember book. this. He actually. said, remember that the true is the whole. Oh, wow. Um, the idea being, you know, don't judge me on just wait till the whole thing's completed. And so anyway, <laughs> I, got, I was contacted by, I think, the Daily Telegraph. Um, uh, which is one of the that's newspapers oh, wow. Here, about, you know, how is this Hegel? And so I gave a little spiel and they printed it. So there was there was the main article was about was about Mourinho. And then there was a little bit from me underneath. And the title Excellent. was oh, Mourinho deploys Hegel in defense. Ah. Uh, that's quite good. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's that's amazing. That's and amazing. you know what? We started with uh, a little bit of, of a story and an anecdote. We end with it. I think that's a perfect way of making the circle uh, back around. <laughs> I will get in touch with you next weekend because that's when the episode will be coming out. And you may have some students or, or, or like-minded thinkers who might want to hear 
what we did today. And I, I really just, again, want to appreciate, I do appreciate what you have done and, and your generosity. And now enjoy the rest of your weekend. We're going to stay on and just kind of talk about upcoming episodes. But again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you very much again. And I wish you also a very good, uh, very good day and a very good weekend. All the very best to you both. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. And once again, thanks to Stephen Holgate for joining Taylor and I on this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour. The very rules of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object. This is the typical violence of information. It's violence because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.